Um, on May 19th, I participated in the Massachusetts Association of School Committees Division 3 meeting with the Massachusetts Association of Vocational Administrators to learn more about the bills being considered by the state legislature to expand access to vocational education by um, increasing the number of seats and also raising the state reimbursement rate to districts for the cost of building vocational schools since they're more expensive to construct. And yesterday I watched the hearing held by the Joint Committee on Education where a number of people testified on this proposed legislation as well as a bill that would require vocational schools to adopt a lottery system for admission. They were the hot topics of, there were 28 bills that were, uh, they were receiving testimony on and it was all vocational education. Quite a few charter school bills as well were almost all vocational education. Um, on, on you know, all sides, for sure. Um, on May 31st, I attended the board meeting of the Collaborative for Educational Services as the Smith Folk representative. We received the budget for fiscal year 2024, totaling $41,389,278. Our contribution to their revenue, based on the number of students we have, is $1,961. In my opinion, membership is a bargain. Um, there was a special treat to be part of the senior class banquet at the Look Park Garden House and to participate in graduation. I'm so appreciative of all the adults who made both of these nights experiences to remember for our students and their families. And finally, we planned for Dr. Lincoln Hooker's formative evaluation to take place at this meeting. However, that item did not make it onto the agenda, and so we will do it next month. At that time, we'll have a chance to ask Dr. Lincoln Hope questions, and he can revise his goals if he chooses. And I will also share the rubric we'll use for his summative evaluation at this time next year. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <clears throat> the next item, may I have a motion to second to approve the minutes of the May 16th, 2023 Board of Trustees meeting. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 We're going to go forward. <clears throat> We're going to have the superintendent's report. Good evening, everybody. Um, so, in honor of Dr. Kirsten Campbell's final meeting, I attempt my report probably to a historical <laughs> <laughs> quickness. Uh, only a couple slides this evening. Uh, we're not here for, this, uh, for me this evening. We're here for our wonderful representatives on the board. So I just have a few updates. I know I, I do apologize, the plan is relatively small. Uh, but uh, back in May, May 17th, we had our final general advisory meeting for the year uh, in the cafeteria. It was, again, it was a great chance to talk to the, the chairs of each of the advisories, uh, looking at equipment needs as we begin to plan Perkins for next year. Uh, that was the, the main agenda item. On the 23rd, uh, we had uh, another session with Sydney Weeks Bradley with our equity work with the team. Uh, this is beginning to wind down, and uh, I was meeting with Sydney recently talking about next steps. Uh, there's sort of a, an idea potentially for some, uh, some work with Sydney over the summer with the Avon team around the retreat uh, to continue this work, and then we'll see how uh, this looks also for next school year. Uh, anyways, that was, that was occurring on the 23rd. On the 24th, uh, Katie, Rosenzas Hansen, uh, she is the State Ag Educator Coordinator for uh, MDAR, the Massachusetts Department of Agricultural Resources. She came out and, uh, and, and met with us and, and took a tour of the, the campus, specifically the Ag Complex. And her goal is she's relatively new in that position. Uh, and she's been sort of doing this road show to all of the Ag schools, trying to figure out uh, who are we, what are we doing, and most importantly, our needs. You know, what do we need from, from MDAR? And uh, it was a great conversation. You know, obviously, we need money, we want money. Uh, but something that Katie really took away was sort of the discussion that we have and, and the concerns that we've talked here at the board is around uh, prospective educators. How do we find new ag educators? Where do we find them? You know, where is that sort of that pipeline? So uh, she has some resources, she has her networks, uh, but she wanted to go back and talk to her staff about uh, how do they, as a state agency, uh, as they're working with uh, local farms and, and, and the local industry, how do they encourage individuals within those industries that uh, perhaps there's another path that you may want to take and you may want to get back and become a teacher. So uh, I hope maybe that was you know, a first step 
uh, to a larger discussion, and obviously it would address a lot of needs that we have here at Smith. So that occurred on the 24th. Uh, that evening, uh, speaking of uh, ag, we were able to celebrate the FFA banquet, the annual banquet. Uh, I want to say from, from my perspective, uh, that was probably one of the most well-run, efficient banquets I've seen uh, when it, from start to finish. Uh, the, the, the layout for the food, the presentations, the students, uh, the students playing all of that. And I think they did a wonderful job that evening highlighting all of their hard work and leadership and obviously the advisors within FFA. On May, on May 25th, uh, Deb and I had a meeting with Marie Burkhart. Uh, so Marie was hired by the Hilltown Health Network uh, recently, and her work is to look around uh, for uh, basically fundraising. Uh, sort of, you know, what are the needs, sort of where are we as a school, and how can the Hilltown Health Network uh, sort of branch out to address the fundraising needs that they have when it comes to the school-based health center. Uh, so it was sort of a working lunch meeting. I, I think we gave her a lot of information. She asked a lot of great questions. Uh, so we'll keep our fingers crossed uh, that that continues to move forward with the health center. On Friday the 26th, uh, the seniors enjoyed their senior picnic out in the football field. And uh, it was kind of ironic. And that was the same day, basically, it was the same day, that we had training arrive from Houston to go through the, uh, the new food truck. Uh, so Chef Lacey and I were going through the training for the food truck as uh, the seniors were enjoying a catered uh, lunch out in the ball field. Uh, so hopefully in the future, perhaps, uh, that might be another opportunity for the food truck uh, to be in operation is to you know, serve the seniors. But we'll see. Uh, but again, the seniors, that was sort of their, their final farewell from the school, and that's when they get the caps and gowns and the yearbooks. It's a chance for them to sort of uh, come together as a class and sign the yearbooks, and staff can go out there and sign the yearbooks. It's, it's a wonderful activity. We had a long weekend with Memorial Day, <clears throat> and then on May 30th, uh, I had uh, our final meeting this year as the MAPA officer team, uh, meeting with, with Commissioner Riley, uh, just sort of trying to pick his brain on uh, big ticket items, uh, really nothing new. Uh, I sort of pushed him on uh, any perspective from his level around, uh, at that point, we weren't quite sure with the federal debt limit, uh, with the ceiling, was there going to be impact on ESSA money? Uh, he wasn't feeling anything or seeing anything there. Uh, I did ask him about the lottery from his perspective. Uh, he is feeling that um, that might be a ship that has already sailed and that at some point that might be coming down the line. I'll talk a little bit more. Uh, I thank Dr. Spencer Robinson for listening to those hearings yesterday and I'll, I'll from my perspective a lot what I'm hearing as well in, in a minute. Uh, so it was a relatively brief meeting. Uh, it was, our, like I said, our final meeting and uh, next year I'll continue to participate in those as a past president so I can be more of a passive participant and listen and, and hopefully continue to move in the right direction uh, with mob and vocational ed in the department. That same day, uh, I was able to participate in reviewing the applicants. We received four proposals for the Horticulture Building Design Services. Uh, there was a subcommittee that came together, same subcommittee that reviewed the OPM proposals when we hired Schoolhouse. Uh, so we sat down, we, we reviewed the four proposals, and uh, we voted to bring two back for interviews, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment. So uh, it was a great. I was pleasantly surprised with the four proposals. One was uh, the firm that completed our feasibility study, and, and the others were also top-notch. Uh, just the, the, the creativity, the ability to problem-solve and give us options, it was nice to see. Busy day on May 30th. That evening, uh, as I already mentioned, was the senior banquet up at Lick Park. Uh, again, another wonderful evening. Uh, it's a, a chance for the shops to come together, sort of say goodbye within the shop. And, and again, it was something new. When I came to Smith, I it took me a little while to understand the importance of senior banquet. And, and now that you're here, you understand those tight bonds and relationships and mentoring that occurs within the shops. When you think of a student spending half of his or her time here at Smith with it, within that shop, there's some very strong bonds that are created with the, with the instructors. So it's their opportunity for the instructors to talk about the seniors and give gifts. Uh, and it's just, it's a wonderful evening, honestly. The next night, uh, Wednesday the 31st, was our senior awards in the cafeteria. That's where we hand out mostly the, uh, the academic awards, all of the scholarships, and you know, other special uh, recognition uh, is done that evening. Uh, parents are invited, family members are invited that evening to celebrate the seniors. 
again, it's wonderful to see uh, the amount of money that is handed out. You wouldn't necessarily think that automatically um, at a vocational school, but there's a lot of support when it comes to scholarships and awards, and I really am happy to see that every year. And then finally, as already mentioned, Thursday, June 1st was graduation. Uh, well run, great weather, besides being very hot. Uh, great speakers. Thank you for everybody who, who spoke on behalf of the students. Uh, I think it was a wonderful evening. I think the families, I believe, uh, this was our third outdoor graduation. Uh, granted, one of them, we had to subdivide into smaller sessions because of COVID. But just looking at the crowd, I believe this was probably uh, the largest crowd I saw in the football field. So it's definitely growing. Plus the tailgating that was occurring in the, in the parking lot. So, uh, a great evening. That next morning, I, I traveled down to Old Colony Regional Grove Tech, uh, Rochester, Mass areas, the South Shore. And uh, I, I met with the superintendent there, uh, Aaron Polanski, but more importantly, met with representatives from Left Field. So, Left Field also happens to be an OPM firm. And uh, there's two individuals from Left Field there that day. Uh, it was a uh, a new engineer, new project manager, but along with a former uh, vocational ed superintendent. Uh, she was actually the former superintendent at Bristol Aggie, so we had the Aggie connection. And uh, Adele Sands is her name. Uh, just as a little side note, they just finished the state of the art science uh, complex at Bristol Aggie. And during that building project, uh, she became so familiar with the building construction process, and yet she was still an educator and, and a leader in education that left field approach to say, if you ever want to get out of education, we'd love to hire you. So she left education and was hired. So now she works with left field and she works with schools because she can speak the, the educational lingo, but she now also understands the construction lingo. So they both uh, came and, and, and met with myself and, and Superintendent Polanski, and they came up with it was like a 30 page report. It was the most professionally done report that I have seen recently. Dr. Spencer obviously mentioned the, the bill that we have uh, at the State House about uh, trying to increase the, the, the revenue sources through MSPA for construction projects, knowing that vocational schools cost more money to construct. That report objectively highlights that that is a true statement. Uh, it's not a bunch of vocational superintendents saying that and we don't have the data. The data is there. It's about a 30% increase to build a vocational school over a traditional school. Uh, and we're talking traditional grade 9 through 12 schools, so a like for a like type of school. We're not talking elementary schools or whatnot. Uh, and that's across the board. Uh, so anyways, that's information that we want to share with the, the state as it begin to ponder on uh, that particular vote. So great meeting. Um, then on June 5th, I had a uh, personal coaching session with Cindy Weeks Bradley. Uh, again, just a wonderful, dynamic personality, a lot of great feedback. Just different ways to think about things. So I, I really enjoyed my time with Cindy this year. On the 6th, uh, we had a mandated NEAC site visit. Uh, Bruce Sievers came out, uh, met with myself, met with Joe. And uh, it was a relatively, in my time having these meetings, probably the, the smoothest meeting, meeting that we've had, probably the most uh, streamlined meeting. We did a brief tour down back to show him the construction projects that we have going on. Uh, it does sound like NEAC is pulling back on the amount of special progress reports I have to submit, it sounds like it will be an annual rather than biannual. Uh, and uh, it sounds like they know the situation that we're in, they want to be supportive, and, uh, but we'll continue this process. So uh, once a year I'll be submitting a special progress report, most likely once a year Bruce will come out and visit and ask questions and see how things are going. But overall I think he was uh, happy and, and, and satisfied with the work that we're doing. So then, uh, I already mentioned about the, the reviewing of those four proposals for the design services. That same subcommittee came back on June 6th, and we actually interviewed two of the four uh, firms. And uh, after deliberation, great discussion, uh, the decision was to go with a firm that was not the firm that we had for the feasibility study. So the firm that uh, we voted on is SNMA. Uh, they are headquartered out of Cambridge. Uh, but their specifically identified project manager uh, is local and actually uh, she has a child that attends Smith and that particular student is enrolled in the horticulture program. Uh, so there's a connection there automatically. Uh, we were impressed by the presentation. Uh, the, the proposed concept, and again, they haven't gotten into official design <coughs> phase yet, uh, 
but the initial concept is, uh, I believe, a more simplified concept of the building versus what we had through the feasibility study. But more importantly, uh, they took the opportunity to look at the campus as a whole rather than simply re rebuilding this one particular building. And looking at the ag uh, complex as a whole and looking at what we want long term. And they sort of had this bigger picture uh, solution idea. Uh, so uh, I believe as a board, you, you saw that paperwork, you saw the documentation, and we'll talk about today's meeting uh, momentarily. Uh, those interviews happened uh, last week, and you know, that ball was rolling. Uh, so moving on. The next day, back to the school based health center. Several of us were down at City Hall, thank you for the mayor for hosting the meeting uh, with the Hilltown Health Network uh, and all of their players. Again, talking about the health center, talking about the, the idea and the vision of the health center here at the school, supporting the school vocational students, but then looking at big picture. You know, are there ways that that particular building and, and services could it somehow benefit a larger population than simply the, the school vocational students? And obviously funding, uh, I, I think they're finding that funding is a struggle. And uh, you know, what are the funding options out there, uh, whether it's at the city level or higher? But I think a very productive meeting. It's great to, to hear the ideas and, and hear the questions that they have. On the 8th, building committee meeting. What did I do on the 8th, building committee um, Anyways, that may have been today. I think the date was wrong, OK? Um, we met as a building committee, and that was our first official time having all of the stakeholders around the table. We had uh, Helen, who was a project manager from SMFA, she's the local up, uh, and she gave her presentation, same presentation as she gave uh, to that the interview last week. And uh, I think there's a lot of great questions and a lot of great input from the, the committee. I want to thank the board. Uh, your recommendations on various stakeholders. Uh, they had some excellent, excellent input, some excellent questions. I really do appreciate the board reaching out uh, to some of your contacts. Uh, next steps when it comes to the building committee, they are overly anxious to get the ball rolling because our schedule is extremely tight and they want to meet our timeline. And again, our timeline is we want to be done the spring of 25. So they plan on being back on site next Tuesday, which is a half a day for us, to meet with our horticulture instructors, meet with some of our horticulture students, and some of our admin, and really talk about the programming of the building. And when they talk about programming of the building, it's the use of that space. Okay, so what kind of space do we need? Uh, we obviously have that space outlined from the feasibility study, but they need to hear it you know, with their own two years uh, to understand what the teachers need, what do the students want, uh, so they can really dive in uh, to the deep end and start the design. Uh, so we'll be on site uh, consulting with, with those stakeholders next week. Uh, beyond that, I did give the building committee an update on the financial picture and uh, where we're at with our revenue versus the feasibility study initial estimate and that potential shortfall. Uh, and again, some of the building committee members, they have some out-of-the-box thinking and ideas around funding and, and potential donations and so on and so forth. So. A lot of things that we want to sort of research and see what we can do uh, realistically and, and follow up, following all regulations and laws. Uh, so that was today's meeting. I do want to mention, uh, so yesterday, thank you to Dr. Spencer Robinson talking about the public hearings. Uh, I did receive a very long email last night, sort of a submarine, uh, specifically around the lottery. And I just want the board to understand uh, what's out there. I know I already mentioned that this last month. Um, so a state senator did attach to the Senate budget uh, an amendment to mandate the lottery. At the last minute, he pulled that, uh, that amendment off. So it's not attached to, to the budget anymore. Uh, but now it's going through the more traditional uh, path of legislation. So they had the public hearings. Uh, there is definitely more support for the lottery. And as a vocational world talking about it, talking with, the, with our advocacy group, uh, it's definitely an easier argument to argue for lottery than it is to argue for our selective criteria. Just on the surface, those who are pro-lottery is easy because we can say uh, it's, we're trying to counter discrimination, we're trying to be more open. Um, and that's, it's easy to make that argument by going to lottery, it's by chance, there's no bias, uh, it's just very easy to put the names into that. As you begin to drill deeper though into the topic, there are many layers to the conversation. 
Uh, one that we don't necessarily have to deal with here at Smith, but it, it is a very hot topic in other regional book texts, is how does a lottery uh, impact or get impacted by a regional agreement? Uh, so most of these regional schools have a regional agree agreement with member districts that outline how many students can get in and so on and so forth. Uh, how would a lottery impact that? So there, that's a layer that nobody can really figure out quite yet. Uh, along with the, the notion of a lottery being by chance, but perhaps that lottery would actually uh, in a, have a reverse effect on some of the demographics. As an example, we know here at Smith we have a very high population of our students that have, have an IEP. Uh, would that percentage stay that high or, or just the law of averages, would that percentage go down if you move to a lottery? Who knows? Uh, so there's a lot of questions around that. I just want to share with the, the board uh, in total transparency, the state changed their admissions policies a couple years ago. Okay, uh, and, and I think as the board you know that, we had to review our, our selective criteria, we got rid of the, the interview, we sort of changed the point values when it came to academics. Uh, we have to look at attendance differently. We can only look at the excused absences now, not unexcused absences. The discipline criteria change. We can only look at sort of the, the heavy hitter discipline infractions um, under the state law. So we're talking uh, weapons and drugs and assaulting staff people uh, or suspensions that are 10 or more days. So they're more serious infractions. We cannot look at the minor infraction that may lead to an office detention because you threw a cupcake in the cafeteria. That no longer we can look at. Uh, but the big thing that has really sort of dictated how we as schools operate under this, the new admissions policies. One, that admissions policy is now owned by the school committee or the board. It's no longer approved by the Department of Ed. So what is in that policy, we as a board have to own it. Uh, so if there's any challenge, that challenge no longer goes to the Department of Ed, it comes to the local school department. That's one big change. The second big change that the, the state has now had a greater oversight on the application data, the admissions data. Up to this point, we've had to submit all of our data twice a year. They're now pulling it back. Uh, so there'll be a submission in the fall uh, to show every single applicant. And what did we do with those, uh, uh, with, with the, the, the admissions? Did we accept them, waitlist them, deny them, so on and so forth? So the point is, the old way of us reviewing the applications and having an appeal process, and then that student can go and appeal to the principal like we used to, that sort of now is null and void. Uh, the state will look at every single application and see if we're truly following our, our application, our admissions policy, and then question us if students moved. Okay, so we have to be, whether we're, whatever side of the argument you want to make, uh, we have to be extremely transparent because we have a lot of people at the state level reviewing all of that data. Uh, so it's, it's complicated. I, I want to you know, thank Rebecca and, and, and the guidance staff. It's a lot of work. With, with the, the new admissions policies that we have. It's not easy, so. Can I ask so, a question? Of course. Um, uh, thinking how to frame it, um, you know, what, a point that was raised again and again in the hearings yesterday was um, that uh, vocational schools don't have access to middle schools, like they can't even get him. And it visits to the schools, and the students can visit the vocational <coughs> schools. Um, and I'm wondering, so if, if the legislation moves forward towards the lottery, um, could what would what would the process be? Is it possible to include language in whatever bill is finally agreed upon? That require that really expands access to middle schools. Right. So, great question. Um, it's complicated. Is my short answer. So, the regulation already mandates that all member districts have to provide mailing labels right. to the, the regional book tech. So here, the only in district that we have is North Lincoln. Um, so I, I've asked that question. We have many other communities that send students here. But because they're not a member of us, they don't technically have to give us their mail news. But because it's already in the regulation, it's a matter of oversight and accountability. And this is sort of this constant MABA versus DESTI argument that we've had over these last couple of years with the commissioner. Um, the department wants us to basically tattle on districts if they don't give us access. 
the superintendents don't want to tattle on each other, but working with their counterpart in the traditional district is not working. So what is that solution? So the re I guess my, my point is the change in the regulation, re the regulation's already there to support them. But that's minimal. Like we're talking, ideally, if students could make a visit to the campus, that was a, that was a game changer for my daughter. Because yes. when she came here and saw what it was like, it just, you know, it just lit a fire in her. You know, she could see herself here. And I don't know how she would have, if she would have had the same reaction just with the assembly with the student. But in any case, so more than mailing those, getting, having presentations made ideally towards the school. But I'm wondering, I'm hearing what you're saying about the challenge. So if vocational schools are required to report the admissions, the, you know, all the admissions data, couldn't um, middle schools be required to report the, what access has been given to the vocational school. So I'm saying expand the regulation beyond mailing levels, way beyond that, and then also have them report it. So, because I appreciate that you don't want to, you know, throw each other under the bus. Right, right. Uh, we, we brought that up. Uh, that there has to be some way that the department is mandating that, that reporting. Like we, we do a lot of reporting, why can't they do it? And, and, and that, as another example, tours as one example, just for the board. Uh, there are some districts that will do tours to the regional book tests, but the sending district won't send any chaperones. Yeah. So they expect the regional book school to basically monitor 300 students walking the halls and they have no idea who these middle school students are. Another one is uh, the middle schools are not counting the tour as time and learning, which it should be time and learning. Uh, so there's a lot of those types of games that are played. Uh, so at the end of the day, we're, we're pitting school versus school, and the students are the ones who are So uh, I would hope that there's a solution at the state level to remove the, the politics between districts. Um, and I think it's account accountability for the solution. What does that look like? Yeah, it's like you, you have the unintended consequences or not, but like the charter schools where they set charter schools up, but you have to be able, from in mo many of the charter schools, you have to be able to transport. First, you have to know the charter school exists. Then you have to apply the lottery. Then you have to transport your child. So they end up with a very pretty selective, many of them, right, selective um, uh, applicants. For, you know, on, this is on the other side. If we're going to say, like, okay, a lottery for the vocational schools, different from charter schools. It's a different type of education, for sure. And uh, transportation is required. So that makes it possible for it. So if you're going to have the lottery, then you've got to give us full access to all students to let them know that this is an option. Presentations as another example. Yeah. We are allowed to do presentations at varying levels. And I've heard this from the superintendents as well. Yeah. And some middle schools will allow the, the vocational school in and have a table in the cafeteria. Yeah. Is that really a presentation? No. Uh, we have other schools where they have the auditorium. And one year, the auditorium was full because every single eighth grader was there. Then the next year, 30 students show up. And the response is, well, those were the 30 students that showed interest. Yeah. Well, does the other 270 even know that there is even this possibility? Okay. So that's where, again, back to accountability, yeah. how do we mandate that every single eighth grader? So I told the commissioner directly in Western Mass, again, we only have one school that is a member of Smith location, that's Northampton. Yeah. Um, the other towns, I have other towns when I was sitting in Josie that said, Andy, we're not going to give you the mailing labels because we're not a member of some location. So my response is, rather, we have to change the regulation to expand beyond member districts. And maybe you declare a school of information, is what the coin, I was coining that particular term of commissioner, that every single middle school student in the state should have access to the information to Chapter 74. I don't care if it's Smith vocational giving the information to the student or another vocational school giving the information. If every single family should know that vocational schools <coughs> exist, what we have to offer so that they can make informed decisions. That was my point. Does, does it make sense for us to um, <coughs> engage with our legislators to some of the company? I mean, I, I've already reached out to some of them to, to explain, to give her a chance to understand where we are. We're different from all the other schools, but just to say like, okay, this moves forward, we've got to have no, they've got to be, there have to be other factors that are included in this. Yeah. The lottery doesn't increase the seats. Doesn't increase the seats, that's been Bob's argument. That yeah. was simply shuffling the seats. Yeah. And the other one is a former school counselor, and, and talking to the middle school counselors, there are many middle school counselors at times that use vocational ed as a carrot 
to uh, engage the middle school student, hopefully uh, motivate them to A, come to school, do the homework, uh, stay out of trouble, and by moving to a lottery, then those middle school counselors lose that care. Uh, so another unintended consequence. So. The interview is also great it's very for good. the job flow. So it's complicated. Yes? I just want to say that uh, there's a situation where there's a student that wants to come to school. They, they have put in their name, they're being reviewed, and uh, apparently through that review process, uh, grandparents got involved, people that attended Smith over the years, and they're very concerned that the student's not going to get it. And uh, is there any kind, I know you say there's not a review process that Joe kind of got taken away from, but I mean, is there any other resource for these people? Because they're calling me and want to know what they can do about this. I'm, I'm upset because their whole family went to Smith School. And it's a generational thing. And now it's uh, on, on our table. And, and, and it's embarrassing in regards to uh, that school that's been around since the 1800s. And we've got generations coming through here. And the one student that may have the lower grade level statistic uh, for acceptance, and uh, this is holding this student from, from getting a letter of acceptance. And uh, what is the review process? What can, what can they do where, what that, recommendation? Well, that student was accepted, but they're on the wait list. Okay. Yeah. So again, we, we rate every single applicant. So hypothetically, 300 students apply. So we rank them based on the admissions policy that we've approved as a board. Uh, somebody's ranked number one, somebody's ranked down to 300. Uh, the admissions policy says that we can bring in 150 students. So uh, we offer admissions to the first 150. And uh, through that process, as we all know, uh, some families decide, no, oh, I'll stay at North I'll go to Northampton High, I'll do the charter school, or I'll, whatever the reason, you know, that they choose not to attend this vacation. Uh, so then we continue to go down the wait list so there's none of the, none of, from 151 to 300, none of them received a denial letter that you're not, you're not in, you're on the wait list. Uh, so then we just keep gradually going down that list until we fill 150. Um, so the point is, there's no appeal. We can't say you scored 250th. I can't move student 250 up to 150 because all of that data share with the state. Uh, that would be another, we just can't do that. Uh, in the past, after we filled or whatever, we could then, there was an appeal process where a family could come in and ask. Um, unfortunately, we also weren't filling our class during that, that time period as well. We weren't taking 150 students. Uh, now that we are truly taking 150 students, we can't go and add a 151. Uh, that's, that's a challenge, and I feel bad for the families. One layer, extra layer, uh, back to when Back in 2014 or so, when the state changed the exploratory regulations. So you talk about legacy families, you know, family generational had, had gone to a particular school. With the exploratory regulations that changed, now students cannot come here and explore in a program that is offered back in the home district. So I've always used the plumbing family as an example. Uh, so I live in Westfield. Uh, my father went to Smith for plumbing. I went to Smith for plumbing. My son went to Smith for plumbing. And we have this three generational plumbing family out of Westfield. Now my grandson wants to come to, to, uh, to Smith Vocational for plumbing. But now with the exploratory regulations, my grandson cannot go to Smith for plumbing because Westfield has Westfield Tech. No plumbing at Westfield Tech, but because they have an exploratory program, my, my grandson now has to go to Westfield Tech, explore there, still realize I don't want anything at Westfield Tech. I'm going to take over my, my plumbing business in the family. I want to then have to apply sophomore year into plumbing. Plumbing is full. That kid's not getting in. Uh, so there is a multi-pronged negative impact on legacy families, whether it's exploratory regulation changes or now the oversight of the state reviewing every single applicant. Uh, it's not a good well, It's not a fun situation to be in. Is it fair to say that the people on our wait list typically are admitted? At the end of the day, I say at the end of the day, not this 24-hour day, but by the time school begins in the fall, 
we do, I won't say exhaust the waitlist totally, but we do go relatively down, correct? Yeah, I think as even the year goes, like, you know, we keep, because even after school starts, we make offers if the seat's open. There are some kids, but I think the past couple of years, we've gone pretty close to the end of the waitlist. Just might not happen. So we try to tell families there's always right. there's always a chance. Uh, we just can't. We don't have the, the right and the ability anymore to move on. No, I understand it, but I think I just want it on the record because if these people really, it's not on the board. The board you you own the admissions policy, right? But the the moving in and, and providing extra credit maybe for legacy families, we can't do that. Okay. Thank you. So this is the same slide I shared last month. I just, you know, we sort of already talked about it. Uh, the design services uh, firm, we went through the interviews, we, we selected, that's SMMA, again, out of Cambridge. Uh, they are very excited to start. Uh, we had our meeting uh, earlier today, and I can, just want to remind the board uh, around the finances. Based on a feasibility study, that's 7.4 million. I want to be openly transparent. That 7.4 did include roughly $1 million of contingency fees. I explained to the building committee earlier today uh, you know, what's sort of in that contingency fee pool. It's potentially when we do uh, soil testing, if there's some issues with soil, uh, if construction materials continue to, to escalate. Uh, there's any number of variables that are very difficult to pinpoint right now in the whole timeline that we just have to sort of budget for. So the feasibility study added basically another million dollars to that. Uh, so could we hopefully have a finished product for less than 7.4 million? That's obviously what I'm hoping for. Uh, but the problem is we currently only have about 6 million uh, guaranteed for this particular project. Uh, so we have to close that gap somehow. Uh, and uh, again, I was I was excited to hear from some of the the committee members having some ideas, outside the box ideas around funding uh, through donations and, and different contacts that people have. So there might be ways through, I'll call it fundraising, but it's not really fundraising, it's just contacts and, and how do we reach out to those contacts to maybe reduce the cost in, in other ways. Uh, but at the end of the day, maybe a loan, uh, i.e. a bond, uh, and what would that look like? Uh, as a board, I think we'll have to have those conversations relatively soon, especially as we get into the nuts and bolts of the design. Is the city our banker? The city's the banker. How much we are obligated and can afford to pay back the bankers, it's not all of the bankers. Well, that's the conversation I think we have to have. So. And again, I mentioned to the committee, uh, and I think I already mentioned here, March of 25 is the goal of having a finished bill. Which buys us a couple of months, but ideally, if we can have the building uh, and, and get all final approvals and permits, occupancy permits for March of 25, whether we officially move in that spring or just buy us a couple of months into the summer to make sure that all the furniture and everything else is ready to go, uh, the plan would be that to open up in the fall of that 25 26 year. <coughs> no donations this month. Uh, in the news, just three articles, one on the left. Uh, I just want to congratulate our baseball team, back-to-back, uh, -back, small vocational school, uh, Massachusetts State Tournament uh, champions. Uh, the middle one, uh, this is 25 years ago, uh, there was a, an incident. Uh, there was a death, a stabbing, and uh, then there was plans uh, through the school to create a peace garden. Uh, so, so in response to that particular incident, so it was, it was interesting to read that. Especially when we look at just today's society and violence, uh, it's not necessarily a new thing. And unfortunately, it, it touched this particular campus 25 years ago. And then the article on the right was a great article. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Ms. Vance, our, our school librarian. She was actually part of years ago working on this particular story, uh, working with the editor back then. Um, they wanted to do a, a reminder, a memorial type of story on the memorial over in East Camp, I believe it is. Uh, of the, the plane crash, uh, and our students in horticulture, speaking of horticulture yet again, uh, they basically annually will go over to the, the site and clean it up and make sure it's, uh, it's, it remains beautiful. Uh, so there was a wonderful article about the students, about the crash, about the memorial. Uh, they, they did a nice job. Looking ahead, relatively short list as we wind down the school year. <coughs> 
Tomorrow night is the sports recognition evening uh, to, to celebrate the student athletes. On Monday, the campus is closed uh, with the, the holiday, the Juneteenth holiday. Next week, we have half days on the 20th and the 21st. On the 20th, our students will be participating in the field day activities. And then Wednesday, uh, the 21st, is the last day of school. It's a half day for our students, a full day for the staff. And then the following week, uh, Wednesday and Thursday, the 28th and 29th, uh, there'll be several staff, uh, several administrators going down for the Connecting to Success Conference at ASCA. That's really the, the leading conference when it comes to, especially for the teachers and even Adam, looking at our PDPs for, for license renewal, uh, a lot of content center P, uh, PD available. Uh, so many of us will be down there for those two days. And then there's a, another long weekend, Independence Day on, uh, I think it's Monday, the 4th. And then I'll be away the following week uh, down to the Cape for the annual MASS conference. That's the, the state superintendent's conference. And then the next Board of Trustees meeting is July 18th. And as of this afternoon, the building committee will meet that afternoon as well. So as I already mentioned, uh, I'll update the board on my self-evaluation for the formative assessment, uh, looking at the goals as well for next year. But also, we'll, we'll talk about uh, next year's planning uh, next month. And with that, I'll turn it back to the chair. Um, Andy has arrived, so. Oh, yeah. uh, anybody uh, to acknowledge Mandy, uh, I will first just to thank you for your, your uh, presence and your time that you've put in over the last couple of years. We really appreciate it. Congratulations on your graduation. Board of Trustees would like to thank you also for that. It's very important. The job that you've done and all the accolades that you've received while being a student here and all the things that you have accomplished in your short term already, you're going to go on and do bigger and better things. I can see that already. But we can't thank you enough for being involved with our board. And if you get thirsty or you want a snack there, we have some stuff up back that you can participate in. But thank you again. And on behalf of the board, you have your coffee mug. There's some uh, chocolate in there for you when you get tired. And then when you're done with the chocolate, you can fill up with coffee. And then you have your, your name tag, you can, your name plaque, you can bring that home. And, when you have your first professional job that I'm asking. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'll go briefly through my report. Uh, so student rep to the board, uh, that information's gone out to uh, students looking specifically at current freshmen and sophomores. Uh, and the board received two names of interest <clears throat> back from students. Uh, enrollment still at the 566. Admissions, back to that, that question before, we did have 126 of the first 150 registers, so about 84%. Um, and an additional 14 of the second round students have enrolled, so we're currently sitting at 140. Um, of that, there's 25 students from Northampton, and they have enrolled, or 17.9%. Um, we still have a little bit of time on that second round responses, and. It says if necessary, but I, we will be sending out a third round of letters. Uh, so we will go through to try to fill those spots. Uh, and as Ms. Wanzik said, over the summer, sometimes we still even have additional students that drop and decide make different decisions. Uh, and we continue to backfill that all the way up through uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day. So um, it's a pretty lengthy process. Uh, MCAS has been completed for the year. I do want to publicly thank Mr. Parks, who does a lot of the organization and oversight uh, on my behalf. Uh, he does a great job coordinating all three uh, exams plus all the makeups, along with uh, a lot of support from guidance. Personnel, uh, PE teacher, we're at an interview phase with that. The health technology instructors were at an inter interview phase. We did hire an assistant principal, Mr. Josh Clark. He's uh, coming to us from Chicopee Cobb. He was a history teacher there, and uh, he did uh, interim assistant principal work at Bellamy. Uh, we hired a math teacher, Chris Blake. Chris was a former paraprofessional here. Uh, he took last year off to complete his degree and did his student teaching with Liz Flores here. Uh, and so he was able to step into that position. We're uh, glad to have hired him. In Ag Mechanics, we hired Seth Reed. <coughs> Seth currently works uh, in, in our custodial staff here. 
Uh, Seth is a great story. Um, Seth struggled here while he was a student, um, returned to finish his education uh, from the world of work, and um, we're really excited to actually have him now as a teacher. I think it's a great transition, I think it's a great story for our students. Uh, and pending your questions, that's my report for this evening. Treasurer set up a man Amazon account for us, so we had lost our line of credit because Amazon did away with it. So the city uh, set up an account with us, so now we're back to being able to purchase from Amazon, which sometimes is definitely not um, cheaper than some of the other, other vendors. And we're still waiting for the approved credit card for the school as well. Um, I've been working with the city treasurer on that, so we're really, um, waiting for the line of credit to be open and then. Um, And last, the cafeteria received a new vending machine today. Um, our food service director, Heather, is very excited about it. It's called the Venue Patient. <coughs> She'll be able to add a lot of the um, cold, um, cold items in there. Students can use the, um, you can use a debit card, you can use cash, you can use um, your account. Um, so Heather's pretty excited about getting that stuff. And last, I've been working with Lorraine Turner, our adult ed director on summer enrichment that will begin in July. Um, for three weeks. Who will have credit cards? If somebody has, you can use your debit card or something. No, sorry. Going back to the approved credit card for sure. the school. Yay. Me. Oh, you, you're the only one who, and it will, does that work as far as you all are concerned here? Just having one credit card? Yes. Because okay. I know that will make that should make things it's much more Yeah. So okay. appreciation to the okay. city for making that happen. So our next new business, I have a motion and a second to approve an out-of-state overnight trip to Indianapolis, Indiana for the National FFA Convention, October 30th through November 5th, 2023. Second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 I have a motion and a second to approve the recommended changes to the facility backup for the end. I have that. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Is there, are there any There's no real substantive changes. Um, you see the first three items are uh, you know, kind of like housekeeping items. Yeah. The fourth item, that's already been approved by this board yeah. to be included into the student handbook, so yeah. it's just the reflecting it the same, same into the faculty manual. Yeah. Uh, item number five, old language said please submit the form to the principal also, but this is electronic form now, okay. and I see requests that come through as right. needed. Um, <clears throat> uh, number six, it's not a Redeker button, so uh, Josh Shear, who's our technology director, just felt like that might uh, confused people if they're looking for yep. something it's just a link address Great. Uh, number seven that's the only real substantive change but that came up through the faculty uh, through department heads in the middle of the year when we had one of our uh, two-hour delay bills 
Mm -hmm. um, it's just one of those weird things. When we implemented the delayed bell schedule, period two ended up being uh, a lot shorter than it possibly could have been. Mm -hmm. So we just adjusted the times uh, to be able to give students that were in period two uh, a little bit more equitable time in the morning prior to, prior to the lunch period. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the updates to the 20. Oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, is there any further discussion on the paper? Aye. Aye. Next one. We have a motion and a second to approve the updates to the 22 through 25 school improvement plan. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Yes, I have some questions. Sure. Um, it is. To me, this is um, one of the most important things for our school, right? I, I don't like the word improvement. I, w I would rather have it be like the school continuing on the path to excellence plan or something. The idea that like, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like you're never good enough. You're always improving. Yeah. So I just sort of want to frame that. Um, okay to ask your questions? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's okay. kind of laid out in regulations but I know uh, I know I'm just I, I just wanted to okay. say that because it just feels yeah. like we're approaching it from a deficit sure. mentality kind of sure you now I, if I could change that language yep. over, then maybe I'll try um, so the, the first thing that I, I just I want to encourage you for the um, I, I noticed that a couple people are at the end of their terms for yes. the school council so we normally do two terms Okay, so, yeah. well, I checked the, I just wanted to check the, sure. the law to see um, if my thinking was, um, if, if my thinking made sense or not, but just, yep. and I know that I've raised this, raised this before, but, um, you know, the law says to include parents and students and other persons, um, and then people who aren't parents or teachers of the students at the school, people in government visits, labor, higher ed, human services, and those who are broadly representative of the school's social and ethnic diversity. I know like the school gives so many opportunities to adults to participate in in all kinds of things, including in the governance. Like mm -hmm. I totally recognize that. And also how um, busy people are with their full lives for sure. And I know that the school council can be a hard um, sell maybe, you know, to get folks to understand Sometimes. the value yeah. of it, right? But just wanted to really encourage you and offer my support if you if that could be helpful to you to get, sure. it, it, it feels so insular, you know, yep. everybody on the council is connected to the school and I'd love to yeah, see. Yeah, so every, it's a really good point. Voices. I mean, every summer this goes out in the summer mailings to the entire community. Yeah. Um, and trying to request people to come on. But unfortunately, you get, yeah, you, sometimes the way things work, you end up having to pull on people. I understand, um, for sure. That yeah. end up with a connection. Yeah. Uh, in order to fill the seats. Yeah. So I, I do understand what you're saying, and, and I think it's a sometimes it's an unfortunate outcome. And I would be happy to help yeah. in any way I can, certainly in Washington, with both the diversity and the, just bringing in other perspectives. And it, it's like I, I, the more people who know about what's happening here are involved in it, yeah. you know, the better. Um, this is going to sound silly, but I wonder if we would have a, a new logo on the cover of it. Yes. Yeah. Logo. I've already. It's, I thought it's funny you said. I thought of it when I looked at. It. Here. Yeah. yeah, it's so fresh. The new one. Yeah. Um, the I kn these were goals from that have already been accomplished. But I would be super interested if you well if you could tell me where I can find the crossover units that the academic and vocational uh, yeah. departments create. So those those are held at the academic level. So they're with the teachers. Yeah. We didn't catalog the, the right. units. So they, those are lessons or units that exist in between the departments. Um, but we didn't catalog them at a Gotcha. And, I, and I'm not looking for more work. I'm just super interested in yeah. it. Let me throw out an idea for you for the school spotlight is to maybe invite some teachers to mm -hmm. share those with the board. Sure. Because I think that, to me, that's what the school is about, is the crossover between the academics and the vocational education. And right. I think you do such a great job over here. You know, reading the, the school improvement plan, it was so intentional. You put time and energy into it, and that would be so neat to hear. Um, I would also love to see, if possible, um, an example of the transcript with the vocational competencies on it. Um, again, I think that is super cool. I would love to know what that looks like. So if I'm an employer the receiving... power strands that you would have got from um, 
what I was thinking is like an actual transcript yep. that's like redacted that has this the student's name redacted. I, I just mean it. You know when you got the power, you would get the power strands at the end of the year for Roscoe. Oh, oh. That's the vocational. Okay, we're going back in time a little while. <laughs> I know, I know. So, because I'm thinking, like, when these are the employers are going to request transcripts from our students, right? And so I want to see what they see when they the student hands in the transcript. Because I'm assuming they won't see the competencies from the certificate. They'll just transcript is just your grades. Grades. So then, why does it say that it's on the transcript here? Which let me look at it. Okay. It's because um, I thought that was super cool to include that on the transcript that. A potential employer would look at. Um, I'll, I'll see where it, I will use more of our meeting. Were you looking at it in? You said goals already achieved. I thought that, yeah, I thought it was in that. I'm pretty sure that it was in the crossover units, the crossover units, the evaluation, Oh, right there, under the second one, under assessment, where it says vocational competencies will be tracked on all high school transcripts. So I interpreted yeah, that to mean that it would be, that it would show up. On yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't show up on the school, official gotcha. school transcript. Yeah. Okay. That's, the official school, yeah, that's just. I think when that goal was originally written, yeah. that's when we moved it to being that yearly progress report. Gotcha. So that's what came out of it, was a okay. yearly progress report. So I might follow up with you a little bit later because I think that yep. um, I love the idea of having it on the transcript. No. Well, I mean... Who sets the regulations for the transcripts? Uh, we do, but traditionally all it is is your demographic info that we keep legally over for 63 years. Yeah. So it's just a record of yeah. the grades that they did would be the official transcript. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So we move to the progress report because in some of these you're going to have, okay. some chapter 74 programs might have 14 overarching um, categories on, in the competencies and others okay. may have 29. Right. So the progress reports look different, but I can certainly bring you Refresh examples so you don't, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do that for the it's, next. It's ringing a distant bell. I'll, I'll do that for the next board meeting. That would be super cool. Yep. Thank you. Just to make it a hyperlink. So this digital to a hyperlink. So it's the oh, oh, take up too much. Do people have digital transcripts? When you get you posted from the university, it's digital. Yeah. So you might just run a hyperlink. Or like, you know, always send them, you know, this is the, the report card, and do a hyperlink, so it doesn't take all that space. Justify. Okay. So on the, um, for the data analysis, mm -hmm. um, does the data team consider any other performance data besides MCAS scores? Uh, in the past, yes, the data team has looked at other scores. So um, <clears throat> there has been other things that where they might look at, um, um, you know, the ELL tests. They might look at, you know, other exams. We were looking at um, the exams that we give for like placement for freshmen mm -hmm. uh, around math. They would look at the results of those. Um, when we did have, uh, it's. That the test, map testing, that's what it was. We did get move away from map testing, but we, at the time we were using that, but then we moved away because we just felt like there was too much time spent on uh, that type of testing. Yeah. Um, uh, what, I'm yes. what I'm wondering is, um, also, like to me, this does not, this doesn't capture our students' MCAS scores. Are there any teacher-created assessments that are considered when you're looking, we're looking at, like, student performance? The data team will look at, uh, Whatever the question is, they're going to look at a myriad of of information, but it's not going to get reported in this gotcha. document. Okay. So yeah, this is just that. has to do with the scores because these scores then go towards the accountability. I know. So that's all that I this know. is right. looking at, and then when you go to our assessment section, it's really focused back on yeah. those scores because it, it's, this is so limiting and it does not reflect the education they receive here. It reflects the education in the districts where they're coming from, mostly, mm -hmm. right? And where so much other kind of education happens here. I would love to have the data team look at that as well, you know? Yeah, they, they definitely look at, they look at whatever data is necessary for whatever the question is. It's like broad in the scope of it. You know? We do, yeah. yeah. I also have the step groups, because if you say 
um, how you support the DLL special. Yep. Mm -hmm. This might be general, then you can also add a subgroup so you can show how you support them else, how they came in, and how they left. Yeah, the dad team looks at all that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, for the um, for the curriculum and instruction goals, um, so it's it's the school council that that creates the goals, right? Correct. And yeah. So what what I was wondering is, um, and I so the goals are clear and easy to understand in all of the sections, which I su you know really really appreciate. Um, when I look at the word instruction, especially, like what, what I would want is for our educators to become more effective um, instructional leaders, right, or instructors. And in the sense of like, students are always changing, the field is always changing, um, methods are always changing, and in a school day, you just don't, you know, school day, school year can be really hard to find time to improve your own practice. Um, but I was wondering if it would be possible or if you would consider um, thinking about like a some kind of professional pra practice goal. So I was even thinking of like I'd love to like have the goal be to um, sort of like so something around uh, professional development for teachers in a quantifiable mm -hmm. kind of way, not in a punitive kind of way, and in as um, self-directed as possible. So some kind of measurement where. Yep. There's evidence that teachers are seeking to improve their practice, whether they're reading a book or yep. taking a class that they want to take or something online or listening to a talk, whatever they want, that that would be in the goal. Like, we want our teachers to improve their practice, keep improving every mm -hmm. year, you know? This is how we measure it. Yeah, I'll, I'll bring that back to the, to the committee as a suggestion. We typically don't add goals in the middle of a plan right. because the three years are for, so this is updating the progress on. Right. But uh, I'll, Definitely bring that back to the school council. Or to put it in the back of your mind. Yep. I'll, I'll keep sure. it in the back of my mind. Um, for the assessment one, for the assessment piece, um, mm -hmm. another thing to think about would be, because um, this is like so MCAS driven, right? What about, improve, what about including the industry related credentials in the assessment piece where you could say like, increase the number of the percentage of in industry related potential credentials that are retained by whatever percent something like that mm -hmm. or this you know have this many students get their industry related credentials something like that i think that would be a nice like counterbalance to the mcas to say that we're a vocational school and we also want to measure that um the college and career readiness like I, I, the school does such an exceptional job of that, like from, from the very beginning, and I do wish we still did interviews in eighth grade because that to me was the very beginning of it, you know, students preparing for it, dressing for it, presenting themselves to Ms. Wansick or whoever was interviewing them, and they were so nervous and excited, and um, one of the, at the hearing yesterday, the Bristol Aggie Admi Admissions Director um, said how valuable the interview was to because some of the some of the legislators expressed concern about like they're not going to vote the vocational school to enter the trades, they're going to go to college. And she said that in the interview, that's when she can really discern that they want to go to a vocational school to enter a trade. Um, so college and career readiness is so fabulous. And then I guess the last question I have, it is the last question, is um, around school climate. Mm -hmm. um, how is that? <coughs> measure like what data determines the goals that the school council sets well the school council just they they identify and dictate goals I mean that's their that's their job so a lot of it might come from student input uh, faculty input questions that come up it might come from uh, discipline data mm -hmm. Um, attendance data, looking at things and trying to identify um, different directions that we might have to go into okay. uh, in order to do those things. So um, if you take goal number one yeah. <clears throat> around trying to create an assembly series and guest speakers, uh, the idea is trying to have enough out other voices for students to hear yeah. um, to influence them. and. Uh, Based on that goal, I've tried to come up with the idea of trying to get two things per grade. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they're looking at that. They're, they're looking at different things that we might hear from attendance, up through the staff, from students. Um, 
we've done surveys in the past to students to talk about how they feel safe, how they don't feel safe. Um, we look at some of the at-risk behavior survey data that comes back and who they feel like they have, they feel connected or they don't feel connected um, or that they have somebody that they, like a trusted adult that they're able to talk to. So like a, a lot of that kind of comes up. So when we're looking at culture and we're like, okay, well, what's the snapshot information of where we think we are? Um, and then how can we move forward on that? Um, identifying, creating common themes and messaging. Um, you know, that one really grew out of the idea of trying to have people, feedback that we got from faculty and, and staff members around um, the idea of the mission statement being up more or, or uh, different things. And um, so one of the ideas obviously was the banners, uh, which was, you know, driven by Dr. Lincoln Hooker was really trying to set that theme and that idea. We had feedback um, from some of the student clubs, you know, questioning the kind of messaging that's around. Um, when we try to put up some of the more positive messaging, that, that came out of work with Spiffy, uh, you know, looking at data and trying to figure out how to spin data differently. Um, so we didn't do exactly, you know, how they suggested it, but, you know, that was an impetus for some of that stuff. So. Um, Kind of, kind of, you know, looking at all that stuff and sitting back and saying, okay, well, where do we go? We added the school climate goals. Um, this was the, I'd have to look back. This might be the first real time that we've added awesome. school climate goals yeah. to try to to try to really look at that. So, um, yeah, that's where that started, and it'll keep growing. Um, I yeah. foresee in the future that you know the principals youth advisory. Committee that I just started this year, um, they're going to be a good, good uh, sounding board for these kinds of things and Definitely. and getting sort of that raw feedback right from kids. Definitely. Thank you for all of that information. Um, do you tell me about the vocal survey that is part that students take after the MCATs. Mm -hmm. Isn't that that's a, is a school? Do you how are the results reported to you? Uh, what do you mean? How, how like, I, I've never seen the results from the survey, oh, so I don't even you, know like what they look like. How you get it back they in are, a not helpful or in a. Oh, it's not. It's almost like a page by page format. You get it back. It's not like a nice spreadsheet. Okay. Uh, but you can print it and you have the data. And, but not super easy to digest necessarily. Or I don't believe. I don't. At least the versions that I've accessed, there's not like great pie graphs or, or yeah. things like that. But okay. you get the results yeah. of the information. Um, I don't know if it is our place or our role, but certainly I would want to recommend that we use um, some kind of school climate survey, that we choose a school climate survey, a student survey, and potentially think about administering at the beginning of the year and the end of the year, so we have like a pre and a post. To, so, because I think so many of the things that are done here are absolutely wonderful, you know, that the student experience is fabulous. And I have so much anecdotal information to support that. And I would really be interested in, in uh, more valid data that shows me that. And I'd also like to know, really, where are we so strong? Mm -hmm. What's the student perception of that? And those are areas that we can leverage to address areas that we're, we're of growth, right, where we're challenged. Um, so I would just like to put that out there for you. I, I think the student experience, my own student's experience is mm -hmm. phenomenal. Um, but again, very in total yeah. with my kids and my family. And I'd love to have that broader view of it. I just think it's a really rich. I used um, panorama data, not here on camping, but in my previous district. Mm -hmm. And it broke it down by um, age, race, grade, by culture. And they also had the surveys already made for you. So you can do it beginning, middle, and you also can look at the questions to say, does it match what you buy? So panoramic. Then they have the interventions and implementation. Thank you. And like user friendly, so when when the school council, which is made up of a mix of people, easy for them to understand. You don't have to be an education graphs expert. And thing. So you just okay. click. And everybody's computer staff, so easy to use. Thank you so much for receiving all my questions. Of course. Thank you. Also. Yeah. Thank okay. you. <coughs> Now, do we vote on this? Yes. Okay.
May I have a motion to second to approve an increase in the cafeteria substitute? We have to vote on this. I just asked that. Oh, we have to vote. Yeah. Is there a motion to vote? Yeah. May I have a motion to second what we have? Yep. Is there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Yep. May I have a motion to second to approve an increase in the cafeteria substitute rate to $15.50? So moved. Second. Is there further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <clears throat> May I have a motion to second to approve the surplus for scrap of Ford Crown Victoria Police Cruiser from Criminal Justice? <clears throat> Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Thank you. May I have a motion to second to approve the surplus for scrap of miscellaneous old lab scales from the Agricultural Department? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. May I have a motion to second to approve the surplus for disposal of 132 mannequin heads from cosmetology? So moved. <laughs> second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. What are you going to do with them? <laughs> I'm going to get rid of them now. <laughs> That's going to be a creepy dumpster. <laughs> Halloween <laughs> decorations. Where are they going? <laughs> All right. So upcoming events, June 21st, 2023, last day of school. And it's also the retired recognition and superintendent's award. What time would that be? It'll be uh, shortly after 11 o'clock in okay. the cafeteria. We'll probably have one retiree in, in attendance. Yeah, <coughs> and then obviously the superintendent award will be in our July, future business, July 18th. We spoke about this earlier as our regular board of trustees meeting. Here in the library, August 15th, tentative regular board meeting, trustees meeting. Um, with all the activity that we have, I'm afraid we're going to have to meet in August. So, um, put that on your calendar. And uh, your last bit of business, ma'am, <laughs> may I ask for a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you.